Hello, and welcome to the last event of this academic year sponsored by the Psychoanalytic Studies Program, or the PSP, which is housed by the Institute of Comparative Literature and Society within the Graduate School of the Arts and Sciences at Columbia University. The goal of the PSP is to encourage the exploration of the rich interface between psychoanalytic thought and theory, the fine arts, the humanities, and the social sciences by offering, by offering a certificate in psychoanalytic studies to master's and doctoral stu students in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences that complete a course of study. Tonight's event is exciting um, because we have two wonderful speakers who will be talking about Jean Laplanche, one of the leading theorists in French psychoanalytic thought, whose work is relatively underrepresented in, American, in the American psychoanalytic discourse because his writing has only been recently translated into English. Uh, Gila, we have today presenting Gila Ashtour, whose new book, Exigent Psychoanalysis, The Interventions of Jean Laplanche, is an important contribution to the new wave of American scholarship that explicates uh, Laplanche's contributions to Anglophone readers. And um, Gila Ashtor will be presenting material from her new book today. We're very, very lucky to have her with us. And we're especially uh, fortunate to announce that um, Dr. Ashtor will be uh, teaching a new course um, within the PSP um, on Jean Laplanche. Um, so if you're interested in enrolling in that course, let me know. And I will give you some instructions. Uh, Gila Ashtor is a critical theorist, psychoanalyst, and writer. Her areas of academic and clinical expertise include trauma, affective disorders, identity, and sexuality. In addition to her new book on Laplanche, she is also the author of Homo Psyche on Queer Theory and Erotophobia, published by Fordham, and an experimental memoir, Oral History, um, um, uh, published by Punctum. She teaches now at Columbia University and at the Institute for Psychoanalytic Training and Research, and she's in private practice in New York. Responding to Dr. Ashtor's presentation is Dr. Elaine Zickler, a psychoanalyst and doctorate in English literature who has been on the faculty of the Psychoanalytic Center of Philadelphia, where she teaches the work of Laplanche in connection with courses on psychoanalysis and homosexuality, gender and sexuality, French psychoanalysis, and she also teaches a master class on Laplanche. And she is in private practice in Morristown, New Jersey. Um, Dr. Ashtor will present first, followed by Dr. Zickler. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Zickler will be presenting um, a short response, which is meant as a spring, which will be meant as a springboard to stimulate for um, conversation between us three and all of you. So um, I'm going to hand it over to um, Gila. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Adele, for organizing this talk um, and for your vision about you know, this program and bringing this all together. Um, it's really an inspiring uh, program that you're running at, at Columbia. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for organizing and Elaine for agreeing to respond to, to my paper. I'm thrilled uh, to be in your company, to have a conversation about Laplanche um, and to hopefully inspire other people to, to really read more of Laplanche and take an interest and go with him uh, where he may lead. Um, so I'll start. Um, Once upon a time, the phrase radical psychoanalysis would have seemed like a contradiction in terms. Not only would radical psychoanalysis have sounded deviant and dangerous to generations of psychoanalytic thinkers and practitioners, but even those who might have welcomed a seismic transformation might have felt that psychoanalysis as a stodgy Anglo-European innovation was too irredeemably defensive for real and radical change. As the American psychoanalyst Arnold Cooper observed in a series of papers from the 1980s, psychoanalysis maintains a peculiar relationship to the idea of progress. On the one hand, the field is always evolving and integrating new ideas from neighboring disciplines. But on the other hand, psychoanalysis goes out of its way to appear as though everything has stayed almost exactly the same. It is as if Cooper writes, quote, we cannot bring ourselves to talk a language other than the one Freud taught us. And therefore we cling to old terminology even when its underlying meaning has been totally transformed, end quote. 
Using transference, the Oedipal complex, and the analytic situation as examples, Cooper notes that, quote, the unchanging words, each of them clinical at root, have been screens hiding their constantly changing meanings and application, end quote. Cooper uses the phrase new wine in old bottles to describe this strange situation, and he wonders how, quote, members of the healing profession came to regard the term orthodox, a term with inevitable religious connotations, or classical, a term referring to cultural achievements as a desirable badge of merit, end quote. According to Cooper, the refusal to change our theoretical models and maps is even more problematic in the context of a science, since it is the psychoanalytic task to provide the biologists with a comprehensive and accurate model of the mind and its functions, conscious and unconscious, and we must assure that this map is available in its up-to-date version. He writes that, quote, our failure to announce clearly our changing ideas has hindered our educational activities, has slowed the acceptance of psychoanalysis among the sciences, and has interfered with the most fruitful collaboration with the disciplines at our boundaries, end quote. What's more, the refusal to modify for its original language, even when the meanings of these terms have undergone dramatic shifts, belies the field's genuine dynamism. Indeed, so effective are the field's camouflages that no efforts are made to develop a newer overall view of psychoanalysis that would accurately formalize and represent the discipline's major shifts. As such, a powerful tension persists between our ideas, which have undergone significant changes, and our language for describing mental life, which has mostly stayed the same. Lest this dissonance seem purely superficial, if things are different in practice, what's the harm in outdated terms, Cooper warns that it's not only our scientific credentials which are imperiled by our anxiety about innovation, but the ultimate scope and scale of our progress is necessarily jeopardized as well. After all, how much can psychoanalysis be said to transform if all the words for mental life remain implicitly untouchable and explicitly unchanged? Shaped by these and other questions, in recent years, psychoanalysis has undertaken a self-reflective turn, calling for a new openness to self-critique that privileges innovation, authenticity, and rigor over loyalty to established guilds. A growing number of clinicians express an appetite for theoretical introspection that explores the limitations of psychoanalytic theory from within. Alongside this increasing interest in self-examination, the psychoanalytic field is undergoing major shifts in its clinical and conceptual priorities. As one significant example of this development, issues pertaining to sexuality, gender, and identity are no longer seen as peripheral to psychoanalysis, but as fundamental to the field as a whole. And topics such as race and class, which were once considered political and therefore impertinent to death psychology, are now acknowledged to be inseparable from clinical work. Taken together, these shifts conduce to a crucial change in the climate of psychoanalytic discourse. Whereas efforts to challenge psychoanalytic doxa were once greeted with knee-jerk suspicion and hostility, treated as an assault on Freud's pre precious legacy, today preeminent journals routinely feature calls to radicalize psychoanalysis by reinventing its metapsychological bedrock. But while this new openness signals a welcome break with the field's intellectual conventions, there is as yet no clear path toward the kind of self-reflective inquiry today's clinicians and theorists describe. Moreover, while it is relatively straightforward to assail the bad old days of psychoanalysis in which arguments took place under, quote, a virtual reign of terror, it remains unclear whether the field's relationship to innovation has been fundamentally altered. In fact, efforts to localize the problem to a particular era, such as, let's say, the 1950s, or a specific style of thought, let's say positivism, seem instead to perpetuate habits of looking externally rather than internally for sources of the field's flaws. Enacting a radical and decisive break with these defensive tendencies in psychoanalytic thought, the French clinician and philosopher Jean Laplanche is uniquely suited to meet the needs at the present moment. At once insistent on preserving the psychoanalytic discoveries which are truly revolutionary and affirming the urgent necessity of, quote, putting psychoanalysis to work, end quote, Laplanche coins the phrase faithful infidelity to describe his distinctive style of relating to the discipline's core formulations. The particular meaning of this phrase will be appreciable through a firmer grasp of the field's enduring conflicts around innovation deviation. 
For now, it suffices to point out that by putting two opposing words together, Laplanche flavor, um, favors tension over easy conciliation and substantive confrontation over rejection. Indeed, whereas generations of psychoanalytic thinkers have tiptoed around their disagreements with Freud, often camouflaging their conflicts and innovations, Laplanche boldly and repeatedly states that all of psychoanalysis, and sometimes Freud especially, fails to secure the foundations for a genuinely radical psychoanalysis. Now, what does radical mean for Laplanche in this context? It means a theory of the mind that is grounded in the centrality of other people. As such, the question that Laplanche requires us to ask is not really, do we want to be self-centered? Most people do not want to be self-centered nor their theories to be self-centered, but instead he wants us to ask, what actually secures the centrality of otherness? What must we add to our theoretical model to really make it centered on the other person? As Laplanche will help us see, even our most cutting edge, avant-garde, open-ended theories are still not really grasping the true potential of a radical psychoanalysis as one wherein the self is not the center of its own internal life. A French philosopher and psychoanalyst who was a student of Lacan, Laplanche spent his vast career demonstrating that there is a deep and abiding resistance to acknowledging the role of actual other people in the constitution of our private psychic lives. And this resistance is not isolated to only one or another side of the traditional Freudian versus progressive relational divide. Not only is Freud the object of his vigorous critiques, but so is Klein and Lacan, to the extent that none of these major theories, according to him, actually go far enough in grasping the impact of our infantile encounter with other people. Indeed, according to Laplanche, the difficulty grasping the role of other people in our development and consequent tendency to locate ourselves at the origin of psychic life is a problem that haunts psychoanalysis from its inception. In order to demonstrate the two possible directions for psychoanalytic theory, Laplanche establishes sexuality as the essence of Freud's radical discovery, and then he meticulously reads Freud's entire oeuvre in order to identify the specific moments when Freud either moves toward or away from this essential discovery. Dubbing these competing tendencies Copernican toward sexuality and Ptolemaic away from sexuality, Laplanche uses a metaphor of centering and decentering to track the movement of Freud's thought. Whereas a common trope often portrays Freud as the victim of later misreadings, for example, Lacan's castigation of ego psychology as betraying Freud's radical vision, Laplanche instead contends that, quote, if Freud is his own Copernicus, he is also his own Ptolemy, end quote. Determined to sustain the radicalism of sexuality's decentering as against Freudian theory's constant self-centering and self-begetting, Laplanche insists on an attitude of faithful infidelity, quote, a fidelity with respect to reading and translation, restoring to Freud what he means, including his contradictions and his turning points, but an infidelity with respect to the interpretation of Freud's going astray in order to find what I call new foundations for psychoanalysis. End quote. Laplanche further explains that putting Freud to work means, quote, demonstrating in him what I call an exigency, the exigency of a discovery which impels him without always showing him the way, and which may therefore lead him to dead ends or going astray. It means following in his footsteps, accompanying him, but also criticizing him, seeking other ways, but impelled by an exigency similar to his, end quote. What is this exigency which impels both Freud and Laplanche? According to Laplanche, the exigency which impels Freud is the discovery of enlarged sexuality, which he defines in the following way. One, a sexuality that absolutely goes beyond genitality and even beyond sexual difference. Two, a sexuality that is related to fantasy. Three, a sexuality that is extremely mobile as to its aim and object. And four, a sexuality that is, has its own economic regime in the Freudian sense of the term, its own principle of functioning, which is not a systematic tendency towards just discharge, but a specific tendency toward the increase of tension and the pursuit of excitation." End quote. The remarkable clarity with which Laplanche identifies enlarged sexuality as the privileged object of psychoanalysis belies the difficulty of consistently maintaining this object in view. According to Laplanche, 
The radical innovation of psychoanalysis, the true equivalent of the Copernican breakthrough, is the discovery that we revolve around other people and not the other way around. In this view, Ptolemaism is actually a natural and common sense idea because it confirms our subjective experience of ourselves at the center, as at the center of our own lives. Not only is it extremely difficult to experience the non-centrality of oneself, but the machinery of perception is more or less designed to hide this fact from view. Self-centeredness is therefore not merely a preference, but actually a functional necessity of language and communication. Our inability to genuinely inhabit other minds means that we're prone to see ourselves as the origin and cause of our experience. But while putting ourselves at the center of our lives confirms how we feel and wish to see ourselves, it is in actuality as psychologically inaccurate as Ptolemy was astronomically false. Just as heliocentrism represented a radical break from the geocentrism of early astronomy, enlarged sexuality demands a totalizing reversal in how we understand the basic organization of internal life. It is not we who are stationary and at the center of our lives, but other people whom we revolve around. As such, what makes enlarged sexuality such a powerful concept has less to do with the superficial sensationalism of genital activity than with how it violates our every effort at self-begetting. Sexuality is neither inherently revolutionary nor automatically scandalous. And if all psychoanalysis could be said to reveal was that sexuality is a repressed wish or forbidden act, then its explanatory potential would be demonstrably narrow. If, however, sexuality can be enlarged beyond genitality and situated in the context of psychic development and relationality, then it dissolves familiar illusions of our autonomy and it attunes us to the presence of the other in us. As Laplanche will show, the primacy of otherness is the radical innovation of psychoanalysis, even if Freud himself did not consistently understand this. Not merely is man no longer the center of his own universe, but he's not even the primary source of his own sexuality. Through the elaboration of several key concepts, Laplanche demonstrates that each individual is preceded by an adult. And this precedence, while seemingly banal, actually has staggering developmental consequences. One of which is that biopsychical development is now a process that fundamentally depends on the unconscious communications of another human being. It's this immutable fact that sets each person on a psychological course that may feel private, but is fundamentally oriented to the other person on whom one's development depends. While each part of this logic can be extensively elaborated in greater detail, it's important for now to show that the central point Laplanche seeks to make is that there are two totally different versions of the story you could tell about sexuality. First, the Ptolemaic version, is that the individual's psychic life is dominated by repressed sexual wishes. The second, Copernican version, is that the individual's psychic life develops in relation to the unconscious sexuality of his, earlier, of his earliest objects. The Ptolemaic story locates the genesis of sexuality within each individual, and as such, it runs into considerable incoherence in its attempt to account for the cause of sexuality's origins. In sharp contrast, the Copernican reformulation says that in spite of how personal my sexuality feels to me, it actually comes at me first from another person. With this categorical, categorical distinction firmly in place, Laplanche becomes able to identify what constitutes the specifically Copernican discovery, the primacy of otherness in me, versus what merely seems revolutionary, but is in reality yet another iteration of Ptolemaic ideology. Turning our attention now to the present day field, we might begin by considering the effort contemporary theories have made to integrate relationality into their models of the mind. This is especially the case, I think, with models that designate themselves relational, taking as they do the centrality of other people seriously and revising ideas and techniques to reflect the growing acknowledgement that attachment is foundational to mental development. As anyone familiar with current theory is no doubt already aware, Relational models foreground attachment by reconceptualizing the unconscious from a bastion of repressed infantile wishes to a repository of beliefs, ideas, interactional representations, and implicit assumptions, most often formed and reinforced in early childhood. In addition to storing affect-laden representations of object relationships, the contemporary unconscious is also seen to be comprised of memories, 
which have been acquired in early childhood but rendered unavailable to ordinary awareness. According to this view, the unconscious is structured around psychic content, which is either dissociative or procedural in nature. In the first instance, feelings and thoughts which are threatening to consciousness are split off and dissociated, ending up in the unconscious as a result of being banished and rendered unacceptable. In the case of procedural memories, representations of early experiences with parental caregivers are abstracted and generalized, forming a basis of knowledge that is implicit and unconscious rather than conscious and explicit. These ideas conduce to a very different model of psychic structure than the one maintained by traditional metapsychology. Here, the contemporary unconscious is neither endogenous nor the reservoir of repressed wishes but either the unfortunate result of environmental failure or the inevitable consequences of cognitive operations. So far, so good. Except that what's missing from this view is a theory of sexuality that treats it, sexuality that is, as distinct and irreducible to attachment needs. As Galit Atlas astutely observes, the circumvention of sexuality's origins is only possible because the entire register of unconscious fantasy life has been systematically obliterated by the field's totalizing reconceptualization of the infant along cognitive attachment theory lines. In fact, Atlas writes, insofar as, quote, the relational baby is an agent and a participant in the bi-directional co-creation of the interaction, it doesn't have fantasy life and functions on the procedural level of interaction. Moreover, in emphasizing the importance of trauma, attachment theory, and infant research, big and small T traumas often become the royal roads to the exploration of mental health situations. And sexuality is seen as another way of expressing residues of early intersubjective exchanges between mother and infant. As mentioned, the relational observed baby seems to not have fantasy, aggression, or sexuality. This is a baby that responds in highly complex ways to her environment, and the implication for adult life is that her sexuality is often described as derived only from early patterns of attachment or as a secondary precipitate of a desire for connection. What becomes clear from a critical engagement with contemporary views is that such an unconscious does not include sexuality. Instead of comprising a distinctive realm of psychic experience, sexuality becomes just another way of expressing residues of early intersubjective exchanges between the mother and the infant. While the coalition of infant researchers, attachment theorists, and trauma therapists that developed this more relational approach actively sought to challenge Freud's views on infantile sexuality, the result is a loss of sexuality to core. As Atlas argues, while infant-adult interactions play a major and decisive role in the foundation of experience, quote, the mother-baby physical tie then is only one aspect of sexuality. Sexuality has its own existence a dis as a discrete phenomenon that connects us through the body with that which is enigmatic and beyond our conscious knowledge of ourselves, end quote. It is precisely this feature of sexuality as a discrete phenomenon that the progressive contemporary model comprehensively vitiates in its assimilation of se sexuality into yet another way of expressing the attachment relationship. Using the terms Laplanche provides, we could say that the contemporary relational model resolves the problem posed by the two registers, sexuality and self-preservation, by simply reducing all of sexuality to the operation of self-preservation. While this maneuver seems initially to solve the problem of how to integrate a sexual drive with the infant's attachment needs, it does so only by eradicating sexuality as a distinctive structural and experiential register. And although today's clinicians may be on the whole unbothered by the absence of a coherent account of sexuality's origins, at stake in these formulations is far more than merely a circumscribed debate about the relative importance of sexuality. For as Laplanche persuasively shows, sexuality is not just another word for genitality or reproduction, but the exemplary term for a distinctive category of psychic phenomena that exceeds and often contravenes the register of self-preservative needs. As such, not only is the distinctiveness of sexuality totally erased by the reduction of everything to attachment, but the very conceptualization of attachment itself suffers from sexuality's exclusion. After all, and as Laplanche will point out in his elaboration of seduction, what kind of attachment can we be said to be celebrating 
if our understanding of the parent-child interaction all but ignores the psychology of the adult. For Laplanche, there's no such thing as the adult's behavior that is devoid of unconscious content, and our attempts to reduce parental activity to the things our parents did or we remember they did fundamentally precludes a more sophisticated and expansive understanding of the adult other's role in the child's psychological development. For this reason, the contemporary model of the unconscious as a repository of procedural knowledge and dissociated memories invariably recreates its own version of a solipsistic psyche, since the so-called other person in the attachment dyad is really not another person at all, but just an external provider of either good or bad parenting experiences. In effect, the contemporary relational narrative conduces to a view of psychic development in which the child is technically equipped to survive and flourish in a biosocial environment, and the adult is required to be sufficiently attuned to the child's needs. This can seem like a reasonable demand, but it treats the adult as merely a technical supplier of the child's attachment needs. Within this narrative, it is the parent's pathology which interferes with the steady flow of attachment goods. And thus the adult is responsible for being healthy enough to prevent environmental failures. But what kind of adult is sufficiently able to transcend every internal conflict? And what kind of infant is naturally equipped to flourish with minimal adult intervention. In this story about the origins of psychic structure, the unconscious is either a vital cognitive function that results automatically from the infant's exposure to nonverbal communication, or the necessary container that's built to store the mind's traumatized and dissociated content. In both of these scenarios, the adult psychology is incidental to the child's development. The adult is merely a supplier of attachment goods, a source of pathology and implicit knowledge, but never someone who plays a necessary role in the development of psychic structure. Put differently, since the unconscious is seen as either a natural counterpart to memory or an aberrant consequence of distress, the only good adult, the only good adult is the psychologically neutral one, the one who gets out of the way enough to enable the infant's natural development. But doesn't such a view amount to saying that the infant already has what it needs to survive and develop as a psychological being? Or that the adult should dutifully supply the infant's attachment needs but otherwise refrain from generating conflict? The problem here isn't only, as many have already noted, that such a standard of parental behavior disproportionately pathologizes mothers or invariably creates impossible goals for the ordinary adult, but that it positions unconscious communication as a burden on development rather than a prerequisite for it. As Laplanche persuasively demonstrate, quote, it is precisely by virtue of this enigmatic aspect of the adult message that the child is stimulated to develop an unusual activity of translation. The child's creativity is kindled by the drive to translate, which comes to the child from the adult's message to be translated, an enigmatic message since it is compromised by the sexuality of the adult, end quote. From this perspective, the adult's unconscious, unconscious material is in fact a significant problem for the infant, but it's a necessary and productive one since it's precisely this encounter which sets the infant's psychic structuration in motion. Returning to the scene of the child's early satisfaction, Laplanche writes, quote, it is the adult who brings the breast and not the milk into the foreground and does so due to her own desire, conscious and above all unconscious. For the breast is not only an organ for feeding children, but a sexual organ, something which is utterly overlooked by Freud and has been ever since Freud. Not a single text, not even a single remark of Freud's takes account of the fact that the female breast is excitable, not only in feeding, but simply in the woman's sexual life, end quote. According to Laplanche, we already know that the adult is responsible for meeting the infant's attachment needs, but what we refuse to acknowledge is that in meeting those attachment needs, the adult's own sexuality is provoked. This is to say, the realm of attachment is undoubtedly central to the child's early development, and the adult provides a vital function, but this experience, while concerned with basic, so-called basic needs, also invariably initiates the development of sexuality because the adult who feeds and changes the baby inevitably has a sexual unconscious. 
Furthermore, it is by virtue of the infant's dependence on the sexual adult for the satisfaction of its basic needs that the infant encounters enigmatic messages that require translation. And it is this process of translating enigmatic messages, those aspects of parental communication which are compromised by unconscious noise, that prompts the development of the infant's own separate and particular unconscious. The kind of sexuality Laplanche has in mind, enlarged sexuality, which is non-reproductive, not contingent on any bodily zone, and not interested in the relaxation of tension, can only come into being through an encounter with adult sexuality. As Laplanche's comprehensive critique of predominant explanations makes clear, there is simply no plausible way for enlarged sexuality to emerge otherwise. What we are seeing is that Laplanche endeavors to establish the outlines of his general theory of seduction by demonstrating that it offers the only plausible account of how and why the unconscious develops and what biosocial realities make this development universal. As Laplanche explains, quote, what is lacking both in attachment theory and attachment observation is a consideration of the asymmetry on the unconscious level. What is lacking in all the observations among even the best observers as is an insistence on the fact that the adult infant dialogue as reciprocal as it may be is nevertheless parasited by something else from the beginning end quote in fact not only is the adult message scrambled by his own unconscious elements but the very fact of attending to the infant's helplessness ensures the adult's own unconscious will be provoked as such, just as there's no such thing as an adult devoid of an unconscious, there's no such thing as an adult infant interaction without an unconscious dimension. The inescapability of this scenario enables Laplanche to claim, quote, seduction is not a relation that is contingent, pathological, even though it can be, and episodic. It is grounded in a situation from which no human being is exempt, the fundamental anthropological situation, as I call it. This situation is the adult-infant relation. It consists of the adult who has an unconscious that is essentially made up of infantile residues, an unconscious that is perverse in the sense defined by the three essays, and an infant who is not equipped with any genetic sexual organization or of any hormonal activators of sexuality. The idea of an endogenous infantile sexuality has profoundly criticized, and not only by me, the major danger, of course, is moving from a critique of endogenous sexuality to a denial of sexuality as such. As we know, infantile sexuality is what is most easily denied, and Freud even made this point one of its characteristics, the fact that the adult does not want to see it. Might this be because it derives from the adult himself, end quote. This is why Laplanche considers Ferenzi's essay, The Confusion of Tongues Between Adults and the Child, a stroke of genius for a quote, dare to use the formulation between the adults and the child. It is only by insisting on what transpires between adults and the child that our theory begins to admit the full range of what occurs by virtue of the innocent infant's dependence on an already sexual adult. Efforts to deny the truth of this universal situation involve either transforming enlarged sexuality into something that is endogenous to the infant or pretending that the adult who provides attachment can turn off his own unconscious. Neither solution is metapsychologically cogent, and both perpetuate simplistic myths about the origin of psychic structure. Laplanche's radical reformulation challenges the longstanding debate about whether psychic suffering is the result of subjective fantasy or events in factual reality. By putting seduction as the origin of psychic structure, Laplanche affirms the complex interplay between the quality of the adult's unconscious messages and the infant's interpretive capacities. In other words, it's simply no longer plausible to speak in terms of what the adult did or didn't do because no amount of remembering parental behavior could ever include those elements of communication which were unconscious and all the more powerful for being so nor could it be possible any longer to trace internal conflicts to subjective fantasy alone, since there's no such thing as an infant who generates by himself the contents of his own unconscious. There is no simple explanation for what causes mental suffering, nor is there any straight 
forward solution, but in forcing metapsychology to see the adult other as psychosexually real, Laplanche demands from psychoanalysis a courageous acknowledgement that the other person is real, sexual, and in an important sense, arrived at my unconscious before I did. So what does it mean to develop a radical psychoanalysis? I think one of the immense provocations of Laplanche's work is the absence of a clear or definitive answer. He shows that only true otherness protects us from the delusions of self-centeredness, but he doesn't spell out which particular concepts end up being self-centered or not. It seems to me that it is the task for our generation to follow seduction wherever it leads, always asking ourselves, what affirms rather than denies the very centrality of otherness that we have tried so hard for so long to secure? Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for this, your incredibly cogent distillation of um, some very, very complicated ideas. Thank you. And now we will hear from from Elaine. I'm just going to unmute. You can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I want to second that gratitude, uh, Hila. I'm so appreciative of what you've written. And um, because I've worked with Laplanche's work for a long time and have read it and thought about it for a long time, um, I'm really happy that right now at this moment, instead of just kind of citing Laplanche as um, in sound bites, which we've seen in papers for a long time, what we have is a real explication going on here in a way to present his work. So, so it, it makes him important in a way and it forces a kind of serious um, engagement. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy for that. I felt like a voice in the wilderness in my own neck of the woods here. So it's, it's I'm really grateful. Um, so I'll do a little bit of reading and a little bit of talking. I'm not, have done have too much to read. Um, the other thing is, I think that the fact that you've engaged with critiques of classical analysis that have been posed by North American analysts is also particularly important. Um, like Arnie, Arnie Cooper, because I think that um, Americans have had a way of holding the French really at arm's length and really across the sea. And, uh, you know, I can tell an, an anecdote about that years and years ago. I mean, I think it was 1989, which was maybe the 50th anniversary of Freud's death. There was a celebration conference uh, at, um, at the old Institute of the um, uh, Pennsylvania Hospital. I don't know if you were there, Adele, for that. <laughs> and and the, the director, I think, of the Institute, um, I think he was somebody important who was hosting this conference, um, remarked on a paper by Meredith Scura in which she used um, Lacan to talk about a Shakespeare play. And he said something like, now, do I need Lacan? What do I need Lacan for? And she said, you don't need Lacan, <laughs> you know, and she said, and she said in a really resonant phrase, um, I'm, I'm, let me reassure you, I'm not now, nor have I ever been a Lacanian. And if any of you are old enough to remember the Army McCarthy trials on TV, you know that this was a way of denying communism. So it was a very, it was, it was the kind of thing where you knew what the status of French psychoanalysis was here and where it was going to be. It was over there with all the other things that were French. So now now I think uh, to answer the, the critiques of the uh, American analysts, uh, I think uh, you know is so important and to bring to import in a way uh, Laplanche here, and of course Jonathan House has gone a long way to to doing that too. So we have to thank him. Um, so um, this intervention that you present in the conceptual dilemmas of the current state of psychoanalytic theorizing. It comes at a time when our romance with relational theory has inevitably come up against the sexuality that it has repressed or even foreclosed on, which is my position, really. Um, what Laplanche did was not to add another layer of psychoanalytic vocabulary to what already existed, but to, in his words, affect an immense simplification of the foundational concepts of the field, answering questions about where the drive comes from for example, which is what you've, your paper talks about. 
Uh, and these are questions that Freud had been unable to answer with any persuasiveness or consistency. Um, and it's interesting that when I saw the, your title of your book, Exigent Psychoanalysis, I, I do this often, I read it as elegant psychoanalysis. And, um, and that's because I think um, Laplanche's theory is elegant. Um, and theory should be elegant. I was taught this in science a long time ago. It should be economical and explanatory. And that's what his theory is. Um, the Ptolemaic universe, and I know this from studying 17th century literature, <laughs> the Ptolemaic universe, even though it was post Copernican, um, uh, caused, produced beautiful structures in art, not only in astronomy, but in art and music and literature and philosophy, and they're still around. <laughs> and so I think in some ways, you know, we're, how much revolution can we expect? I don't know, really, because um, we're still in the Copernican universe. And, uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a heroic effort to get us out. Um, so yes, Laplanche's vocabulary has been floating around our literature for years. Phrases like the enigmatic signifiers often stripped of their theoretic force and their role in the formation of the ego and the formation of fantasy and of the unconscious itself, the enlarged sexuality that you deal and make reference to. So um, I'm just gonna make another quote from Laplanche. Here is Laplanche on Tome cosmology in the post tolme age. Given its complexity, it is almost impossible to add anything to it. It is a system in which each unexplained detail, far from calling the whole into question, was made the, op was made the object of a supplementary ad hoc hypothesis, overload, blockage. One thinks of what happened to Freudian metapsychology at a certain level of complication when it began to fill out certain inadequacies with new concepts without bothering to determine whether they were congruent with the whole or whether it was not rather the whole that should have been reconstructed. And this is exactly what you're talking about. So your work is so essential and along with people like Dominique Scarfone, who also, you know, is been explicating Lacan in doing the work of explicating and presenting, uh, I'm not Lacan, Laplanche's work <laughs> as a significant theoretical intervention in Freudian theory, one that critiques Freud in such a way as to call the whole psychoanalytic edifice since Freud into question, really to deconstruct it, but along the lines of Freud's own internal contradictions and fault lines, what Laplanche calls his goings astray, right? Um, so this intervention departs from the model of say object relations theory and more recently relational theory, as you point out, in that Laplanche demonstrates how theorists like Klein, Winnicott and more re recent attachment and relational theorists presented opposing views of the Freudian psyche and its formation that somehow managed to recenter it again, either in the infant's own fantasy life or in a dyad that was noticeably lacking in a sexual unconscious. One in which the mother primarily, of course, served as a need satisfying object responsible for regulating intolerable affect for the baby, but without a sexual unconscious of her own. And we know that the mother, the psychoanalytic mother can be three things, a breast, a container or a mirror, but what she can't be is a sexual a woman. Uh, for Laplanche, the other is, first of all, a real person, and at the same time, delivering unconscious messages to the infant, unconscious to herself, that is the mother, unconscious to herself, that's the important part. But this unconscious is inflecting her interactions with the child. So we have um, the other in me, but also the other in the other. <laughs> um, so Gila, I'd like us to begin where your paper ends <laughs> in the question of particular concepts, uh, just as a thought experiment that we could all participate in, as well as the whole structure of so psychoanalysis that we in inhabit in North America, particularly, and also around the world. Although I think North America has its particular 
um, narcissistic closures and blind spots, right? Uh, Leo Bersani, uh, in conversation with Tim Dean and Kaya Silverman, had this to say, this is very provocative and I'm not sure why I put it in here, except that it, it's like a thing in my head, like a, what do you call it? A, a, an earworm or something that won't stop, you know, for years. So here it is. Um, it's, uh, he had this to say about Laplanche's concept of the enigmatic signifier and primal repression. Quote, the extraordinary thing I think is that this idea traces the end of psychoanalysis as a useful way of describing relationality. The Laplanchean unconscious, unlike the Lacanian one, is a mass of non-metabolizable -meta refuse, the waste of the enigmatic signif signifier. As such, it is useless in describing relationality. For me, the theory of the enigmatic signifier is one of the most moving events in the history of thought because it shows psychoanalytic thought refining itself out of existence. Laplanche would never admit this. He sees it as another step within psychoanalytic practice. Excuse me, I'm all dry. <laughs> I find this so fascinating. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to even say much more about it. But it's it's a real provocation, I think, and a kind of admiration in a way um, that that Bersani expresses. And I'm not sure what he means by it, but I put it there. To take Laplanche seriously, and not just as a source of new psychoanalytic sound bites that we can sprinkle in our papers. Um, is really to bring a plague to psychoanalysis, the way psychoanalysis was the plague brought to America in the first place by Freud. And I mean, not only to the field, but to our own practice. After reading Laplanche, I feel that everything changes, but I am hard put to know how to stop speaking the Ptolemaic language that is my psychoanalytic mother tongue and, be and begin to make necessary translations, right? And am I teaching it? We talk about this in the classes that, that I teach also. I began some years ago to make a list of what we might have to jettison or at least put under serious interrogation. But as you end your paper with this challenge to the next generation of psychoanalysts, it might be something we could begin together now to think about. Uh, and that is what in our common vocabulary changes its meaning given how Laplanche reorganizes psychoanalytic concepts and what is rendered useless and vestigial. So we can all think about that individually here, but I'd like to begin by highlighting what I see as your unique translation of Laplanche in chapter four of your book. And that is the way you enlist affect theory as the missing link, as it were, in understanding the implantation of the enigmatic signifiers, uh, the messages from the adult sexual unconscious to the infant. So I, I was wondering if you could talk about the role of affect and how you came to think about this in relation to Laplanche, because he doesn't talk much about it, except as anxiety and a little bit about um, the fact that he doesn't think it, it, and this is confusing, we don't have to get into it, but he doesn't think that affect is in the unconscious, but that there are how does he put it? Um, affect is, uh, I have to read it because I can't repeat it. That's how confused I am by it. Um, uh, okay, the messages which are the object of the first translations are not essentially verbal, nor are they intellectual. They include in large part signifiers of affect. So he, he, he's basically saying that we have signifiers of affect, but in the unconscious itself, there's no signification so that it, it gets stripped of its signification. Um, you know, we don't have to get too much into the weeds, but I, I just found that um, I wonder how much this regulating function of the mother doesn't take her jouissance into consideration of the sort of alien nature of the sexual unconscious. Um, and I think we need to recognize that a theorist like Fonge, for example, might have a different might have more at stake um, in the notion of affect regulation 
than in the notion of a generative and truly disruptive uh, sexual unconscious. Um, he speaks about excess in a very different way from say the late Ruth Stein did or the way Laplanche might have. So that's my first big question to you. <laughs> if you choose to answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, I, I want to respond to everything, but I don't want to uh, interfere with the, the Q&A as well. Let me just say um, uh, a few things. Number one, I think um, to answer, I guess, your last question um, about affect, I think, and regulation, I think, first of all, yes, Laplanche does not talk about affect much. And it's important to note that when he was writing and certainly surrounding Lacan a little bit before him, affect was this very controversial thing. And Lacan hated the notion of affect and hated the idea that we needed to care about feelings. Um, and Lacan thought that the emphasis on feelings was sort of falling into the trap of, of, of the imaginary and that affects lie. And why ask your patients what they feel, what's gonna come out is what they think they feel and it doesn't even tell us anything about what they actually feel. And he got into, he was obviously was very controversial, but he, he was, you know, very resistant to that language and couldn't stand it. So affect would certainly not have been a comfortable word for anyone, any French theorist of that generation, Andre Green being one notable exception who writes a book on affect um, and really tries to take it on. And is like, I see Green is really trying to say like, hello, what about affect? Like we can't even do psychoanalysis without affect, where the hell is it? But for the most part, it doesn't get really dealt with in any kind of serious or rigorous way. So. I, I want to be very clear that that is a way that I, I'm putting Laplanche with affect theory, but it is not indigenous to his own thought in a certain sense. But what I see, the reason I think that that move is justified um, is because it seems to me that we need to account for the mechanism of translation of the infant's response to the adult sexuality and affect regulation is what enables it us to do that. And what I mean by that is that the idea that the baby requires the adult to regulate its own, its own affect is also what exposes the baby to different kinds of content, different kinds of the maternal, of, of the parental affective communication. And some of that affect, a lot of that affect can be worked on. It can really be be, the baby can make use of it and can translate it and can form ideas based on it and, and thoughts and can it can go into the the structuralization of the baby's own mind in many ways but I think there are what he's talking about is that there are um, levels of affect or uh, kinds of affect that have to do with sexuality on the on the adult's part that are too loud. And he, you know, I think we can use the, the vocabulary of noise. The affect is it's too distracting. It's too convoluted. It's too impenetrable. The baby has no clue what to do. Baby cannot work with this, with this content. And that's what gets repressed and goes and comes to form the baby's own sexuality. Um, I think what affect gives us is a way out of to me, the very narrow limits of thinking about all of this as content, as, as like, you know, mess, even the word, you know, Lacan's, uh, Laplanche's enigmatic messages, it tends to sound, I think, to most of our ears, very heavy on like language mm -hmm. or the verbal. And that if it would, if it was verbal, it, it would not work, it wouldn't add up. Um, so in order for this for I think Laplanche's model to work as he wants it to, we need a concept that is not tied to language in exactly that way. And, and, and I, you know, you could talk about different reasons why he uses that language and he kind of goes back and forth too about like messages and he, you know, yes, that's also coming from Lacan and it has a way of sounding um, very heavy on the symbolism. Um, but I think we need some way of talking about what is going on between the, the infant and the adult that can account for the mechanisms of, of translation as a kind of necessity um, and right. not as, yeah. So I, I don't know. Yeah. If that I, I just want to interject because I've been thinking about this a lot since I kind of formulated the question. And if you think about the message, um, it, it's, it's a combination. If you th think about a sign, for example, not just a signifier, but the whole 
concept of the sign. You've got um, facial expression on the yeah. part of the adult. You have voice and intonation, right? You have physical gesture and touch. Yeah. And they can be in sync or they can be out of sync in various ways. And so um, if the child's ex- being, uh, if pain is being inflicted on the child, for example, and, and, but there's a smiling face or there's an indifferent face or the child's having an excitation, but something else is going on with the adult. I mean, for whatever reason, yeah. um, it, it, there is this scrambling or this noise that you talk about. So the translation becomes partial, but it also inflects um, this excitation of the, of the sexual, right? You know, yeah. it inflects it. So I, I agree with you that um, affect has to be complicated. Uh, and the, the notion of the message has to be complicated also. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I agree. I don't think that's where the affect people, that's not how they're using it. They're not, yeah. they're not using it to talk about sexuality um, in that same way. But I think, I think it can be used that way. Um, I mean, anyway. we can't just think of, say, um, Sylvan Tompkins' chart of all the of facial expressions, you know, because it isn't, it isn't that simple to translate an expression into the message that the child may get from any expression. Yeah. And this is where I I don't know if this can open it up even further to people in the audience who um, may be not as familiar with either Laplanche or affect theory, but I think it would be profitable to put some of this in relation to things like Christopher Bolas's concept of the idiom or Winnicott's talking, Winnicott talking about the, you know, going on being like all of these things that we don't even have really good words for people are literally inventing words because what we're what we're trying to describe and i think they're related is what is getting transmitted that is not language it's not a specific message in the content sense and yet it is it lodges in the in the infant's um psyche and it informs so much of how they hold themselves in the world so i don't know if if you know we can put these things side by side and help expand sort of what we're trying to get at and how that might you know um, lead to more ways of thinking about it but yeah um do we have questions from the audience or do you want us to keep going (laughs) i can't hear you you have to unmute (laughs) sorry yes i i'd like to um say a couple of things um I think Laplanche has a lot to say about um, some of the some of the difficulties that I have found with um, you know American psychoanalysis and and um, um, in my training, which was primarily you know, ego psychological. Um, although I did have quite a bit of supervision with um, with Roy Schaefer, who introduced me to the Kleinians. It seems to me that um, a lot of um, a lot of uh, post Freud psychoanalysis has, has seems to implicate a fantasy, um, a fantasy that after our development, after our childhood, we are impervious to. Mm-hmm the influence of other people that the there's this i um this idea that we are we are the die is cast mm-hmm. and and i think that it is a kind of a, a fantasy of omnipotence in, in a sense mm-hmm. that we are the rulers of our own destiny now and you know the, the die is cast and you know we alone are in charge of our destiny and our fate and all of the decisions that we make mm-hmm. uh, and that we're um that we we can't really be influenced by others, and I, that sort of idea has always um, has always um, uh, caused me a lot of difficulty. Um, so that's one thing. The, the second thing is that in in my own um, my own research, my own writing about um, the erotics of the analytic encounter, um, I, I I I came to realize that there was a split in American psychoanalysis in understanding the erotic transference. So Freud has this famously ambivalent paper about um, the erotic transference. And and then there's a a kind of a split um, in in the discourse. So on the one hand, there is an erotic transference, which is 
essentially the reactivation or the revival of, a, of an ancient infantile residue. Um, and it's, it's purely transferential. And then there's Lowald with what he called um, um, the loving, the loving interaction, um, or the, the the loving the loving um, of the patient, which is uh, 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 based on your appreciation and affection for the patient, but it's completely bloodless, literally. That's what Larry Friedman called it, bloodless. You know, <laughs> there's no arousal, there's no excitation, um, and it seems to me that Laplanche is uh, an answer to the split, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but this has tremendous clinical implications mm -hmm. for the understanding and the treatment of the, of the transference in general, but I think also the erotic transference specifically, in particular. And I would, would love to hear um, your thoughts about, um, your thoughts, both of your thoughts about the handling, well, the implications for the handling of the the erotic transference or any transference. You yeah, know, I, yeah, I, I love that. And I, I think too, it, it brings me to something Laplanche says um, when he talks about the transference, when he talks about treatment is that we have to own up to the fact that inviting a patient into our office is such a provocation. It is such a reopening of the seduction and of the scene of seduction that we are to ignore this is to continue to hide behind some kind of, you know, I don't know, technical or bloodless or like transactional idea of what is going on here. When he says, you know, we are reopening that seduction, we are reopening that scene. And we are, in, I think, also creating a new one. You know, it's not yes, just yes. a repetition, but well, yes, um, that's right. And so it, it is a seduction. And I think what you have it right now in the literature is still this notion that, again, this that the seduction is, is a violation. The only conditions under which something seductive happens is, is a violation or some anomaly or pathology or could, and it's, it's not, it, it's, it's the condition for treatment to occur. And well, yes, I mean, there you have an invitation to, to roam in a person's mind, what could be more erotic right. than that, right. you know? Exactly. And so and then, I, and then how are we not, we don't even, the fact that we're not even conceptualizing it this way means we're certainly not doing any of the heavy lifting in terms of thinking about what implications that has for our work with patients. Like, shouldn't that determine what some of our techniques, if, if you know, I mean, it, I, I would think it would have some major consequences. Um, I mean, my sense is that to even say erotic transference is is a um, redundancy uh, because the uh, because the situation, as you say, is reviving the original. Uh, the whole situation of analysis is the transference. It's not that something special called the transference happens and develops, and it's not based on content either. It's not based on oh well your mother did this to you and now you think I'm doing it to you or I, this happened to you. And it's not, it's not that because it is that the, that the unconscious is provoked by this same situation of the, the asymmetry, the fundamental anthropological situation yes, yes. of the child who is like, um, like Will Kahn calls it the, the, the annals, the person who's supposed to know. Well, in, in the, the Laplanche, it's, it's like you have this position of, of uh, of the person the, the, the uh, an analysand is relying on you in some way has been invited to come and share these intimacies with you and immediately that's the situation and and it's our job to protect that in a way I mean I don't know about specific interventions but to interpret it is to violate it in some way I think that to see it as what almost what Freud called the positive, the background, the enabling background of the analysis, you know, and of course not to yield to, to actual and acting things out. <laughs> yeah. I think that um, one of the problems with the relational school is the, the need to get away from that elemental asymmetry. Yeah. Oh yeah, and yeah, we had a problem with Ferency too, because then it devolved into this uh, dyadic, uh, you know, uh, mutual analysis or whatever it was. And, and um, but, um, you know, we I have some questions from the audience. Okay. Um, 
Um, Patricia Plopa, I hope I'm I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, asks, please comment on what Laplanche understands about the analyst's unconscious impact on the patient she is working with. Well, that's exactly what we, yes. Analysts are real objects with unconscious fantasy like the mother and entity, absolutely. What, um, what is, um, I shouldn't answer these questions because oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is the implication for analytic theory and technique? Well, I, I think that's, we're finding out. <laughs> That's yeah. We're, we're we're wondering about. Um, but I think I think one. Want to add to that? I think one thing I want to say to that. Um, thank you for the question. Is that I think um, something that's always mystified me about, and I'm, it sounds like we're all criticizing the relational. I don't know how that happened, but um, I I think the relational. I, I want to say that the reason we to me it feels important to criticize the relationals because that is I think the it has been a real attempt at actually getting out of a lot of the problems with classical psychoanalysis so it's picking up where I think a lot of good you know a lot of good and important work has been done but what's mystifying is that somehow the technical implications of a lot of relational theory is that the analysts should include themselves more in the treatment when in fact, the implication of thinking about it from the perspective of Laplanche and from seduction is that the stakes are so high because it's already a scene of seduction that the analyst has to be that much more careful about how they protect the, the patient's space in this, in this seduction. And so the requirement is, I think, according to Laplanche, to really preserve a kind of um, preserve boundaries, preserve space, preserve the patient's right um, to have a kind of experience that is where, of a, as safe as possible, a kind of seduction. And I think um, that takes us away from some of what goes to, what has become a sort of more contemporary norm of, you know, including one's own responses or one's own experiences in the treatment as an analyst. I think he, he would take us quite a bit away from that. Um, I know Elaine, if you have a sense of that, but that's my-, my, my. I, th I think you're right. And, and I think we have to think about what um, Laplanche talks about. Uh, there's implantation of the enigmatic signifiers, but there's also intermission, which, which is a more violent, you know, can be an actual, um, violation of the child, but it could also be just this overwhelming sense that the child is not able to translate enough of these messages at all because of the overwhelming nature of the involvement of the adult in some way. I guess we're Winnicott called it impingement, um, but I, I think you can, you, you know, I, don't, I have the sense with Winnicott that I don't know what that impingement exactly means sometimes, but I think with Laplanche, it's very clear that he's not talking about actual abuse or seduction of a child. And that when that happens, you have then a real pathological situation. What he's talking about is, nor is a normative, a normal situation. And that, and then someone mentioned Lowell, I mean that the, the unconscious in Laplanche's theory is generative and creative and it, it's creative of culture it's out in culture it calls it, it talks about the transference of the transference so that um we're when we're affected by art it's that same experience of, of standing in a state of entrancement in front of a wonderful painting or in front of a piece of literature you know, with a piece of literature that challenges our our sense of language in a really important way, almost a tr mildly traumatic way. Like I can think of authors I've read who, who have challenged me this way. So it becomes, I think a really wonderful, you know, to, to hold back with the patient is to allow them that, mm -hmm. that ability to be creative, to draw on their own, um, uh, their own, whatever the mishmash is that's inside their own <laughs> unconscious and try to translate it out, no. you know? <laughs> in, in, in a funny way, I think, I think that for me, working remotely has facilitated that. Really? I, I, I don't really understand why. Uh -huh. I have, we have another question from um, Irene Cairo. Hi, Irene. <laughs> um, um, she's asking on um, behalf of Rogelio Sosnick, for many Kleinians, affects are the mother of meaning, signifiers. How, in Laplanche's theory, or translation of Freud, 
um, I'm not sure I'm reading this correctly, um, Irene. Um, Freud saw affect as a process of discharge. How do affects become in, for Laplace, a meaningful aspect of the structure of the mind? Hmm. I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding it correctly, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to answer what I think is the question, if that's okay, should I do that? Um, yes, or um, actually I can ask, um, let, where are you, Irene? I'm going to demute you so you can explain. <laughs> um, I will give you your voice. Uh, where there, there you are. Um, can we demute Irene? Is that possible? Um, Irene, I'm trying to demute you. Uh, perhaps you could. Um, okay, so we are demuted. Uh, oh, there you are, Irene. Okay, can you so, can you rephrase your question? Um, Rogel, it's Rogelio's question, so I'm going to let yes. him. Up. Uh, in Freud, you know, since uh, emotions are process of discharge, they don't have any self meaning. In the Kleinian mm -hmm. school, you see that the early stages of the mind is around meaning connected with affects, you know, the exchange of affects between mother and baby, and, you know, projective identification, the creation of emotional states in the mother and the baby, and that. In La Planche, at least my reading is that uh, he goes very much in the theory of representations. But where is the place of emotional states in providing meaning? They are the core of the meaning. They, 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 they have some role in this. You know, how he deal with this aspect that is in Freud, process of discharge, but in, in itself, they don't have that strong meaning that it is in the climate school. That, that, Yeah, thank you for thank you for the question. I, I think that this is why um, I think we need affect theory to and maybe we'll bring it closer to Klein in this way. But I think this is why we need affect theory to um, to put underneath Laplanche's concept of translation and seduction, because I think you're right that there is a risk that it otherwise sort of revolves around representation and language. And it sounds, it, it can end up sounding very much like what is getting transacted between the mother and the infant are, are messages that are, you know, can be decoded or deconstructed or have content in a certain way, as opposed to what I think they are, which is affect that, that the baby makes meaning out of and that the, that the infant, um, you know, translates as an act of binding, um, and 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 as that goes to work on. But I, I don't know if that helps answer it a little. But I, I'm not sure that um, that it's a finished thought in Laplanche how that works with what you're saying about about affect and discharge. We have a question from Iran, um, Meyer Alanaji. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Um, is a psychoanalytic psychotherapist joining us from Tehran. Welcome. <laughs> Um, and the, the, the question is, I know this is a very broad subject, but how do you conceptualize attachment theory with its emphasis on attachment being an adaptive normative inclination and Laplanche's stance toward implantation of signifiers pregnant with se sexual messages unconsciously coming from the adult? Are these two positions mutually exclusive or are they just pointing to different parts of the same phenomenon? I think that, um, I thank you for your question. I think that for Laplanche, it would be a problem if we separate them out and see them as mutually exclusive. Because for him, the point is that the fact of our attachment needs is going to like sort of doom us as it were to running into sexuality and developing our own sexuality as a result. And I also want to add in relation to that, that there is a profound tension um, between our needs for attachment and regulation and sexuality, which means that sexuality is going to drive us in excess of what we need. It is not operating in the economy of regulation in the same way. So regulation paints 
a kind of rosier picture of us confronting the mother, getting what we need. Ah, oh, we feel better. Great, we're good to go. Laplanche is like, that's never going to happen. Because you're even when you get what you need, you get a lot of things you don't need also and now you have to do something with it and that becomes your sexuality and now you're driven and this is your drive and you are always sort of driven in excess of what are your sort of basic needs um so i think the answer to that is that we we can't really segregate them in our thinking and in fact the fact that we do is for laplanche a sort of symptom of the fact that we literally can't keep these two things together in mind, as you see in, in, in our, in some of the things that are emerging in the field today, but that we have to understand how they intertwine themselves in the developmental process um, for Laplanche. I hope that answers this broad, but very important question. Yeah. I, I, I think that um, you can separate it out and this notion of excess can't be regulated away. Um, because um, that's the rub, you know, it's the, it's the excess is the parent's own unconscious. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a kind of uh, perpetual motion machine in a way. It's kind of wonderful to think about, really. I think it's a very exciting theory. It's not an unconscious that can be excavated and, oh, Koda, we're done with that. We don't have to think about that anymore. You know, that's not what's going on. Uh, with LaPlanche. We have a question from Eve Watson um, mm -hmm. and a comment. Uh, thank you, Gila, for a most elegant talk and for giving such a brilliant exposition of LaPlanche. I agree. Mm -hmm. It seems like you are concerned not only with the work of transference within a psychoanalysis and what LaPlanche adds to understanding that, but also the transmission of psychoanalysis in our 21st century world. I would love to hear your thoughts on what you think Laplanchian theory adds to this project, the transmission and the future of psychoanalysis. Thank you, Eve. Thank, yeah, thank you, Eve, and thank you for being here. Eve has written and edited an important book, very important to my thinking, um, on uh, bringing queer theory and psychoanalysis together. Um, she edited that um, a few years ago, which I love and, and has a lot of queer theorists writing in it, which is very important to me. So thank you, Eve, and thank you for being here. Um, I think that, you know, I think, uh, how to answer that question. I think Laplanche opens the door to, to a lot, to, to beginning to have new ways of thinking about the role that culture plays, the role that race plays, the role that the external world plays, instead of what we're currently doing still very, talk about elegant, it's like inelegantly, which is like starting with the separate psyche and then like, oh, we should add gender. Oh, we should add race. Oh, we should add class. And it's like, okay, now it's incomprehensible. Now we've added 10 things. This doesn't even equal anything I can actually work with and understand, it just sort of checks all these like boxes. And I, I think Laplanche is giving us ways of understanding um, our permeability in a new way and the role of the external the sort of world as, as sort of not external in, in a sense, you know, as, as the way that we Absolutely. are, yeah. you know, com completely shaped by it. And, and we need to put so much pressure on that divide that we are still endlessly yeah. stuck in, I think. Um, yeah, please, Adele, if you have something to add. Oh, I, I, I'm just, you know, wholeheartedly, you know, agreeing with you. Um, I think there, uh, I, I said before how analysis has a problem with, you know, this idea of, um, or American analysis with the idea that you are sort of impervious to others, well, you know, we're also not impervious to culture and we all, we have cultural identifications and um, we have a collective cultural unconscious. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that in terms of the, the bringing psychoanalysis into the 21st century and the project is to, to make it more, um, um, more culturally um, sensitive and smart um, so that it, it doesn't have to be a caricature of itself, but rather something that helps us to understand our culture and how our our culture affects us. And then, you know, we, it's, it's a constant generative cycle that we create, you know, we have fantasies, cultural fantasies that then, you know, create, help us to create new new things. And 
in an endless kind of cycle. Eileen Keller um, says, I really appreciate the quality of the clarity of your thinking about the attachment Laplanche question. Uh, I would agree with that. Are there any other questions from the audience? We have, a, we still have some time to talk and I think we could probably talk all evening. Oh. I, yeah. Ah, okay, Cecilia, I'm sorry, Cecilia Tayana, culture is part of a secondary repression, according to Laplanche. It needs to be distinguished from the socius, which is the source of primary repression. Is this a comment or a question or? Yeah, I think, I think Laplanche has written a little bit about that, about um, culture and sociality. And so maybe that's what um, Cecilia you're referring to. And I, I think also, you know, I wonder, I've often thought to myself, I don't know if people in the audience are how where they are field theory, or I think that's another, I think that's a kind of concurrent attempt, I think, to get out of some of these boxes. It would be interesting to put some of these things together, Laplanche with, I think, um, mm -hmm field theory or way of enlarging um, sort of the world that we're placing ourselves in. Um, but I think also with psychoanalysis and to this question about the 21st century, I mean, I think in some sense our thinking um, about ideology and our thinking about so society has in many ways gotten so much more sophisticated in the past few decades that psychoanalysis has you know, to catch up maybe a little bit with that is what we're seeing. Because we actually understand a lot more than we than we have before about even, you know, gender is a good example or race, like how these things get transmitted, how they shape us. And yet we're really mm -hmm. lagging in how we can even conceptualize. And I think partly for what something that um, Elaine mentioned at the beginning, which is that for Laplanche, it's very important to have elegant theory. And, and Arnold Cooper talks about this too. And there's a way in which our, our theory is not operating that way because it, it is constantly just adding things in this like bucket, you know, Laplanche off has a word, he calls it like a bathtub. You know, we just like, <laughs> just keep throwing things in adding, but we're not refining anything. We're just like, no, no, we understand that we'll even, we'll invent a, you know, a word or put two words together and um, right. yeah. Right. I wonder if in, unless there's a good question from somebody right now, if we could just um, address, and this goes back to a question that was just asked recently about um, the, the difference that, does Laplanche distinguish between psychotherapy and psychoanalysis? He doesn't really, I mean, he does as a process, but not as what happens in the office. I mean, he's pretty much, it's not as if you say, well, I have a psychotherapy patient or I have a psychoanalytic patient. It's more that um, when you're um, detranslating <laughs> uh, a particularly naughty or uh, non-functional translation, <laughs> um, you're, an, you're analyzing. And the rest of the time, you're probably doing something supportive and psychotherapeutic. And but really what he says is that the, the patient is that the analysis is the one who should be engaging in the synthetic or synthesizing uh, function um, in that essay on uh, uh, between hermeneutics and determinism, which is very good. And he talks about mourning, for example, as a model for psychoanalysis that you're constantly reworking the past and reweaving like Penelope, you're unweaving, in the nighttime and then you're reweaving in the daytime. And it's a beautiful um, metaphor, I think. So that it, and again, elegance, he combines like, why do we spend a lot of time saying, well, we're gonna teach psychotherapy, then we're gonna teach psychoanalysis. When really, if you, if you understand, if you're reading psychoanalytic theory, whatever you're doing in the office, that's what you're, you're looking for your, you're waiting for the opportunity to make a really psychoanalytic intervention. Otherwise you're not doing it every five minutes or even every session. Um, or I challenge anybody to say that that's what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's, thank you for bringing that up because Laplanche is I think very humble about that and saying yes. that you know, yes. you're lucky if there are yes. moments when it feels like it's psychoanalytic in, yes. this, in this like ideal sense of your deconstructing, your unbinding, your yes. Most of the time, that's what none of us are doing, and and binding has its own has its own function, which uh, yeah. you know I, I think is very modest and and really resonates with what most of us experience in treatment. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's important to to say that again. Um, 
I don't know if you've all seen um, Agnes Varda's film, The Gleaners, and then, this, then the uh, subsequent, the um, sequel to it, but Laplanche is in both of them. And <laughs> it's wonder really wonderful because in the first one, neither of them recognize the other person. <laughs> And in the second one, they've, they've come up to, to date with who they are and who they've been talking to. And he says at one point that he thinks that psychoanalysis is like gleaning because the ego is formed in the field of the other. And uh, I love that mm -hmm. expression. The ego is formed in the field of the other. Yeah. Yeah. Or arises in the field of the other. Something like that. Something of that nature. Yeah. <laughs> Right, my, right now in my mind, I, um, I'm thinking about Bion and I'm thinking about Winnicott um, uh -huh. and I'm thinking about um, how all of this fits together, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think someone in the chat asked a question about embodiment. Um, it's, a, it's a long question, but I'm just going to, um, you know, at the end. Um, I don't see it. Just now, I think Adam um, asked, "What does language? What does Laplanche say about embodiment, or how does Laplanche enrich the psychoanalytic thinking about embodiment?" Oh, okay, I see it now. Um, so I think, I mean, I think you know, I don't know that he talks about it um, nearly as much as um, as he should, or or I think that's why we're sort of talking about affect, um, as it were. But and he doesn't talk that much about um, about gender either, although he does have some work that he does on that. Um, but I think, I think it's much as you mentioned in your, in your question, Adam, which is that um, it's about infusing sort of these interactions and exchanges that are care-based between the infant and the adult um, with meaning, um, but not meaning that is sort of, that comes from the adult alone, but meaning that the that the infant makes or that the infant comes up with too in this exchange. Um, I don't know if that um, speaks to your question at all. And I don't know if Elaine has something more to say about embodiment, but um, it's, a, it's a good question. Well, I can say hello to Adam because he's a, <laughs> a fellow of ours. Um, I, I, I don't have much to say, except that to think about the fact that messages are embodied as well, especially with infants, because it, infant means no speech, you know, an, an, an infant in the Latin is, is a being without speech, right? So um, all of these messages are, I think, transmitted through the body, through the voice, through the handling, through the intonation, through language that the baby doesn't understand yet, you know? Yeah, let me just add one thing to that, um, Adam, too, which is that he has this lovely phrase, Laplanche, that he uses quite a bit when he talks about sexuality, which is that he says it's like a splinter underneath the skin. Right. Which right. I think is a very vivid image for the way he's talking about how drive, how sexuality, like sits and maybe even feels mm -hmm. um, to oneself, that it is like uncomfortable and making you restless and driving you in ways that are not um, fun all the time and that certainly don't feel good. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is another way that uh, we can see Laplanche is interrupting some of the, you know, ways that we end up talking about care um, mm -hmm. and, and regulation that is, uh, you know, very maybe bloodless or soft or has no edges. And I think that splinter is a very vivid image. Um, we have, um, we're, we're pretty much out of time, um, but um, if we can, Norman Stela um, has a brief um, comment. Um, Laplanche gives a major part to the concept of afterwardness in his thought. Would you comment on how he integrates this with the other rich ideas you have discussed today for which I am most grateful for? Um, you know, I think we were just talking about, uh, you, Elaine, you brought up Penelope um, mm -hmm. taking, taking it apart and putting it, you know, the, the weaving and back together. Gila, do you have um, something to say on this? About, I think we should wrap up. About um, afterwardness or weaving or all of it. Yeah. Um, I, not in particular. I mean, I think he does talk about, um, he has wonderful ways of talking about the scenes and the ways that we um, recreate, you know, the repetition of certain scenes is giving meaning to earlier ones. I would recommend um, John Fletcher, his, who's edited one of the most well-known collection of Laplace's essays before Jonathan House has translated everything 
to whom, yes, we are eternally grateful. Um, but J John, John Fletcher also has written about afterwardness um, and Laplanche, and I think very interesting ways that, um, you know, deal with this a little more directly. Um, nothing much I can say mm -hmm. in one minute, but, um, but thank you, yeah, for, for the yeah. I think Jonathan House was with us briefly, um, at least. He's no longer here, but I um, was very happy to see that he, oh. <laughs> he came. Um, so I want to thank um, all of you for a, a really exciting evening and um, informative and um, really um, a, just a high level of scholastic um, excellence, you know, scholarly excellence, for which I'm deeply appreciative. And um, I'm so excited that Gila will be teaching um, La Planche and maybe I should enroll just to make sure <laughs> that the class happens, but I would love to sit in. Thank yeah. you all for coming. And it's been a great year for the PSP and we're hoping to bring you another wonderful year of programming next year. Um, thanks again to our, to our panelists today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Adele. Thank you, Gila. Thank you, Elaine. Good night and thank you, Sarah. Bye -bye.